when it comes to you. Because no matter where you are in your life, God is so big that he is what you need him to be. He is the Savior while he is the Spirit. He is God at the same time he is Christ. So no matter how you relate to God, you need to be focused on the fact that some point right now, there's a way you relate to God. Here you have a list of names. These are just some of the names. I had to cut them down. I wasn't going to put 2,000 names up here. And some of them are more descriptors, like the Lamb. Some of them are more names, like Jesus, let's be fair. The Holy Spirit is described as the Holy Spirit. But no matter how you do it, I want you to write down the fact that at your point in life, you relate to God a certain way. You've got something that causes you to relate to him. And Paul speaks of it in two different stages. We're going to talk about the first stage, when what he describes as the milk stage. We're going to talk about that stage where you first come to God and the way you should first view God. His message changes. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapters 2 admits that his message changes depending on you. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 1. And when I came to you, brethren, I did not come with superiority of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstrations of the spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. So he admits when he come, the first thing he did, he said, I'm going to forget everything when I come to you. And the first time I talk to you, I only want to talk to you about one thing, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Coming to God, and this is the starting point, and this may be where you're at. I don't know what you wrote down, but there is a point where you're coming to God and you're viewing him as either Savior, Lamb. We have multiple descriptors here, Sanctifier, Healer, Redeemer. And the first step to all of this is that. Our first relationship with God needs to start as our relationship of going, God, I am helpless. God, I am sick. I am sinful. I am unworthy. And our first step to coming to God has to be that we first realize who we are. We go through every week we offer an invitation. And one of those parts I want you to think about with this first part, when we talk about repenting. Repenting takes two parts. One is figuring out I have something to repent of. And two is figuring out that Christ is able to heal me, to restore me, to bring me back to where I should have been if sin had never entered the picture. And so when Paul says that he's speaking to these who are not in God, he doesn't start with, let me tell you about everything I can tell you about God. Let me tell you about the complexity of all the rules. Let me tell you about everything he demands of you. He says, let me know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. But he goes on in verse 6. And he contrasts that with something more. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. Yet we do speak wisdom. He just said that he did not come in persuasive words of wisdom. But then he begins verse 6. Yet we do speak wisdom. Among those who are mature, a wisdom, however, not of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. But we speak God's wisdom in a mystery. The hidden wisdom from God, predestined before the ages to our glory. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood. For if they'd understood it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And just as it is written, things which eye has not seen, and ear has not heard, and which has not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. 
This contrast is important because you have this strange twist. You go from, as Paul described it, there are babes in Christ. And then those who are feeding on meat. And he says that it is good that they're feeding on milk because they're young and immature. But the idea was not that they kept feeding on milk. Could you imagine if you met someone today, 30-year-old guy, 40-year-old guy, 50-year-old guy, and you're like, what would you have for supper? Milk. What would you have for breakfast? Milk. Okay, yesterday. Milk, milk, milk. Okay, where, where do you get your food from? Milk. Do you have your own cow? Yes, I have milk. And to us, that would seem so strange that someone would go, yeah, I have milk every meal. It's the only thing I eat. But yet when we look at our Christianity, we, sometimes we get stuck in that first stage and it goes, well, you know, I've got the milk. Jesus and him crucified. That's it. That's it. Everything. Else. That's all. There's nothing more. And that's what he talks about in this first stage. He talked about milk, 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 milk. But how often is it to come back and say, all my relationship could, should consist of is me coming to God and seeing him as savior. Saying, well, thank you, God, that I was nothing and now I'm saved. That's enough for me. You know, I'm glad we have that level of relationship. Let's not take it any deeper. We've had a good courtship. We've dated. You've healed my problems. That's good for me. And a lot of Christianity is called seeker Christianity. You hear of these new churches called seeker churches. They're nothing to do with people actually seeking God. They're saying, make it easy, water it down to the point they're just drinking milk. And the only people you ever preach to is those who need milk. Because, you know, those who need milk aren't going to get a lot out of meat. And Paul would agree with that, except that in the church, it is so easy to get stuck on milk. And you're not going to grow. You're not going to become a strong human being if all you ever have is milk. We don't want to always go into the deep theology. He calls it the mystery. The wisdom in mystery. The fact where we start to talk about God and we say, how does God really relate to me? How do I really come to God? And in a, the scripture reading, we had this. He said, you have that form of godliness. You do. You talk about Jesus. You talk about God. You talk about all this. But you have denied the what? What is it that we are so common to deny? Power. Let me use the words that sound like I'm a Christian, but deny the power of it. You know, let me have the semblance of sounding like I'm really into God, but yet... He saved me. That's enough. That's as far as I'm, I want my relationship with him. And it's the same as that 40 year old man drinking milk every day. It doesn't make sense because he never grows to full adulthood because all he's drinking is the simple. And all he's saying is Jesus Christ crucified. That's it. And he tells them that among those who are mature, we do speak differently. There is something more to God. I talked about how this is the stage that I usually sit in, is I am all about learning about God and this knowable God and being taught. But there is a third stage. And if we don't get there, it can easily be described of us as having a form of godliness, but denying the power. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, starting in verse 10. For to us, God revealed them this wisdom, this truth. For to us, God revealed them through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, even the depths of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the spirit of a man, which is in him? Even so, the thoughts of God, no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received, not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God, which things we also speak, not in words taught by human wisdom, but in those taught by the Spirit, combining spiritual with spiritual. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. 
But he who is spiritual praises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. In this, we have this great power. He's speaking up. He's talking about if you stayed in your natural state, which you didn't change that much when you said, God, I am unworthy. You looked at your natural state. You said, God, I am sinful. You have reflected and done nothing to change it. You then come to God and you realize that Christ is Savior. You realize that Christ's whole purpose was to restore you from that natural state. That natural state of sin and rescue to him. But yet then God teaches us of himself. And connected with that is that Holy Spirit. We, we have heard certain things so often it becomes commonplace. We talked about this morning, eating the body and blood of Jesus. I admit the first time you ever heard that, it had to be a little weird. Some guy walks in here and says, eat my body and drink my blood. A little weird the first time. It's so weird that the people listening the first time left. The only ones that were left were the apostles. Everybody else who was following them went away because they were a little weirded out. And the apostles said, how is this? Why? You, you know what you just said was really hard, right? They've all left because what you said was too hard. And sometimes that greatness is lost in the commonplaceness. The other one that loses its power is, how often have you heard of this building as a church, a temple, a... I don't even know the list of things I could make it out to be. And, but Hebrews tells us there is nothing that can contain God. God is not flesh that a building contains him. God is spirit. And that same promise that says, whosoever believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Is similar to the one where he says, believeth and is baptized and then speaks of the spirit. But this is the church of Christ and we have a tradition. We will stick with Christ. Even in our teaching, there has been times in the pastry of the church of Christ that we have neglected one of the three parts of the Trinity. Three members, sorry. Means me to say part. And that's the spirit of God. But yet God says, if you do not have the spirit in you, you do not belong to him. So all these teachings that taught no longer is the spirit present, no longer is the spirit in you, no longer do you have the spirit, does not mesh with what the Bible teaches. And when we read this, we should get that sense that God wants something. He doesn't want us to be fixed. As in, we were sinful, we're fixed now, good. Carry on your natural way, keep drinking some milk. He doesn't want us to get stuck in the, let's learn more about God. Because we will continue to learn more about God. We will continue to grow deeper in God. But he then wants us to experience him. And too many of us stop at the point where we say, well, I can go to the Bible and I can read about God. And I can learn about God. But until I put rubber to road, I have no idea what it feels like. Until the word becomes in me and I live it out, I don't experience it. Until I say, yes, you are God and you answer prayer. Until I pray and experience God moving mountains. I am not stuck where he wants me to be. I am still stuck in that natural where I can, I can learn important spiritual things. But until I am ready to let God use me, then I'm going to include wisdom. I'm going to include natural. You know, there's a lot of people who believe in God. But when God speaks of what he really wants from us, he describes it in a way. He says that he wants our heart, our mind our soul, our strength. I included the mind 
But if we get stuck on saying, let me learn a little more about God, then we have that form of godliness and are denying the power thereof. Because if we never approach God and expect him to be God, then it is just words. And God doesn't want that. God never designed us to stay as babes. He never designed us to stay in wisdom that is human thinking. He designed us to begin to experience him because he gave us his spirit. He gave us the Holy Spirit. He gave us the spirit of Christ. He gave us the indwelling spirit so that we could experience him. Because God at a distance is how the Hebrews saw it. They didn't look at God because they knew if they were to look at God, they were dead. There was no way their unholiness could come to the presence of God and make it out alive. And then Jesus offered something so completely different. And we take it back. Humans have, we, we talked about it. He talked about 9-11. I love it. And it's this backwards. We keep going backwards. We keep going backwards. Keep going backwards. Things change for a second and then we go back to norm. You know, 9-11 happens and everybody's, you know, hey, I need meaning in my life. I need to reach out. I need to be close to community. I need to love people. I need to experience life because every day is precious. And then what happens? We slowly get back to our old tradition. Well, you know, I'll die sometime, but this is a long ways away. You know, I'm just waiting. You know, I'll serve God later. You know, I'll take care of that. Yeah, I should probably go visit them, but I'll do it next week. I should call that person. I'll wait on that. And when it comes to God, we have that same consistency. We see God doing something so different for us that he sends his son, takes on human flesh, dies for us, gives his body and his blood for us. And we go, let's go back to how it was in the Old Testament where we look at God at a distance. Where we view God and say, let me learn a little more about you, God. And not say, God, I've learned something about you. Can I experience it? How many times does God keep us from experiencing something because we refuse to experience it? We refuse to experience God in his spirit because one, we are uncomfortable with his spirit. This is one of those lessons that's weird in the church of Christ. Because you start mentioning the Spirit, and everybody goes, I think he's Pentecostal. Really? It's the Holy Spirit. We still get him. It's not like we gave him away. He belongs to us. Don't act like somebody else owns him. God didn't go, I'm going to give my Holy Spirit to this group. This group will just keep them quiet. They don't know what's going on. But we treat it like that. We say, oh, you can't discuss the working of the Holy Spirit because some people believe that he works this way. Some say he can do miracles. Some say there's all kinds of apostolic gifts. Some say there's not. Well, if you get into that, you know, that's, that's not milk, is it? That's not milk. That's not seeker-friendly church, is it? Seeker-friendly church would say, let's just focus only on Jesus. Let's not talk about the fact that God wants more. That God never says anywhere that he's taken his spirit away and we're just left to experience God as learning. Because if that's true, you need to quit praying because it doesn't make any sense anymore. The first time I went to a church of Christ, they could not answer me this question. Went to a very conservative church of Christ. I said, why do you pray? The only answer I got was so bad, I really almost laughed. Because God tells us to. Well, does he do anything when you pray? No. What do you mean no? Well, he works in a natural way now. It's so different. God can't do. And you're like, you just said God can't. You, you do realize you told the master of the universe. Hey, God, uh, I know you uh, impregnated a 99 year old couple, but uh, you can't do this one. I know that whole virgin birth. You can't do this, though. I know that whole resurrection, but God, this is big. This is you still working today. 
And the other one is we're so afraid of feeling anything. Because feelings can be taken too far. They can. I can get into feeling. If I feel it's good, then it's good. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Back up a little bit. But I can take it to the other extreme and say feeling is nothing. I should come to God and do what I'm told and not experience anything. How many of you have ever experienced love and not felt something? I don't even care what you loved. You felt something. I don't know if it was just your heart racing, your stomach was upset. You have feelings associated with what is happening. And our life is not what God wants it to be. As long as we get stuck with just learning and not trust God and say, God, I really want to experience you. Coming to God and saying, you've told me that two or three agree on anything. It is set. Coming to you two or three and praying and going, God, I expect you to do stuff. Coming to God and saying, you are powerful. Respecting him enough to say, God, there is nothing impossible for you. That makes sense to us. And coming to God and saying, let me feel your presence. Not where feelings become everything, but where feelings go with what is spoken. Because who can understand God? And you would think it would end. You think he would just cut it off. No one can understand God. Get it. Be quiet. He doesn't. He says, who can understand God? Only him who would have the spirit of... Wait, he's describing us now. Wait a second. Only those who have the spirit of a person can understand that person. But you have the spirit of Christ. And it is a beautiful relationship in which you fully experience God. 